All right, I think we'll get started then. Um, our speaker today is Dr. Holly Menninger. She's uh, the Director for Public <coughs> Engagement at the uh, Bell Museum. And uh, she has a bachelor's degree in biology from Denison University. I guess that's in Ohio, if I'm not mistaken. And then she went on to do a PhD uh, in ecology from the University of Maryland. And she's been at the Bell uh, Museum for about two years now. Um, so we're really excited to listen to her and learn from her about public engagement. Awesome. Thank you, David. Hi, everybody. Oh, I should get on the camera so that I can say hi, everybody out there, if you're out there or out there later and watching later. Thank you all um, for inviting me here today. Uh, it's always exciting for me to get out of the museum and onto campus um, and interacting with and engaging with students and faculty because we really do want to be the gateway to research at the Bell. And so I'd love after my talk to talk about ways that we might be able to work together in the future. And some of you are already known entities to us, but um, it would be great to, to talk about it more. So today I'm going to talk um, not so much about my museum work. I'll talk about that in a, a little bit towards, towards the end of the talk, but I really want to talk about sort of um, my journey and the evolution of my um, thinking in bringing together um, the public and researchers, scientists to work together, to collaborate together, to create new knowledge, to do research, um, a practice that we call citizen science. And um, I thought I would start by talking about my journey in citizen science going into the Wayback Machine from when I was first introduced. I didn't know it was called citizen science at the time, um, but uh, way back when, um, in the 80s, when I was growing up in Ohio, um, I was an avid uh, subscriber and reader to Ranger Rick magazine, which I'm proud to say is still around today. And in the pages of Ra Ranger Rick, I was learning about a problem, um, particularly in, in the Northeastern US, um, but also in the Midwest of the problem of acid rain. And so there was a call for young people to get involved and help us understand um, where, where acid rain is falling and um, describe and, and understand those patterns. So I sent away from my test kit that included pH strips and I had my little bucket. And after every rainstorm, I would, I would leave out my bucket and I would collect and test and then send back those measurements on postcards. And I sort of sent it out into the void. I didn't know what, what like nobody ever contacted me about those results, nobody did, but I felt like I was contributing to something um, and I was helping to better understand our world. And it was really only later when I was taking environmental science in, in college that I understood the, the magnitude of the problem and also the role that everyday people played in helping us describe um, some, of those, some of those. There, there was some very um, important um, research that was based at universities that were detecting these patterns, but there was also a really important role that was played uh, by citizen scientists. I didn't think about sort of participating in scientific research very much um, beyond sort of my, my college days, but thinking about it in terms of the citizen science enterprise until um, like in 2011, I was attending a science communication conference and I was asked to, to sample my belly button for science. Uh, there was a group of people led uh, by this guy, Rob Dunn, who's an ecologist at NC State University. He's also a really accomplished um, science writer. And uh, he and his lab group were embarking on this study of the belly button microbiome. At the time, micro uh, research in the human microbiome uh, was really exploding. We we're really coming to understand that the role that microbes play as our body's first line of defense. And so there were really a number of important papers describing the microbiome of our gut, microbiome of our skin, um, and the funding for that was rapidly increasing, as well as sort of the ease with which you could study these organisms that no longer require culturing those microbes, but using molecular methods, you were able to um, quickly identify those, those species. And so I, I donated a sample, but I was, I was very intrigued about uh, why they were doing this um, and ended up connecting with Rob and his group later and actually went on to work for him um, and became deeply involved, literally, um, in, in the, the belly button biodiversity project. And so we took that interest in understanding the skin microbiome, but then focused it on a place because we wanted to engage a huge a swath of the public um, and help them understand and think about um, the role that their skin microbiome may play but then also um, contribute to some new knowledge. We didn't know, nobody had ever studied the belly button. It's this hidden place uh, that if you ask people, when did you last wash your belly button? They have a hard time 
remembering most in our experience is what we, we, we found. Um, but we don't understand what makes my, the microbes living in my belly button different than the microbes living in your belly button. Um, and we wanted, so we wanted to get a better understanding and use this sort of silly place as a way to engage the public in that kind of, that kind of research. And so with the Belly Button Biodiversity Project, um, we sampled hundreds of well, people sampled themselves, hundreds of people swab um, their belly buttons for science. We used molecular methods to identify patterns of species richness and species diversity. But then because we were working with the public in this larger citizen science context, it was really important for us to, for them to sort of get something out of it. They, something that I didn't receive as that kid sending in my postcard for um, on the acid rain. And so we wanted people to feel connected to the project. So in addition to doing the molecular analysis, we also plated samples and provided every participant in our study with their own belly button portrait. <laughs> uh, and so these are um, a, samples, it's about a dozen samples from, um, from our various participants. And you can see, even just looking at the morphology of, of the bacteria growing on those plates, that there is a great deal of difference in uh, microbial diversity among some of our participants. We weren't just doing demonstration science. Like some people are like, oh, you're just doing this as a thing. Like we were actually asking legitimate uh, research questions. We wanted to understand and describe those patterns of belly button biodiversity. And so this is one of the uh, figures of what we found. So this whole pie chart represents the abundance of microbes that we found across our, our samples. And we had several hundred uh, samples in this study. And each slice of the pie represents a different um, genera um, or group of bacteria. And the size of the slice of the pie represents the abundance of microbes. Um, and that can, microbes can be abundant because they're present on lots of people, or they can be abundant because they are found um, they're found in great abundance on an individual. Um, and as you'll see, um, there's really only a handful of species that were super abundant in our samples. Most of them were quite rare. And if you think about comparing what we found in belly buttons, um, the patterns weren't all that unlike of what you see in patterns of biodiversity in the rainforest. Whereas if you have a plot of rainforest and you're identifying every tree trunk and what species it belongs to, um, there may be hundreds of trunks there um, you may find hundreds of species, but most of those individual trunks just um, belong to just a handful of species, and those species we call oligarchs. The patterns of biodiversity that we found were predictable. So I could come into this room based on what we saw. Um, I could tell you what five species were going to be most common in this room or out there, um, but I couldn't tell you to the level, predict to the level of the individual. Um, how diverse, what, what species were in your belly button. And that really um, confronted, confronted us. Uh, this is what my belly button looks like. I'm very proud that I had 72 species in my belly button and um, I was above average. We couldn't explain. We asked people for, to help us, you know, to just to describe their patterns of bathing, how often they wash, um, did they use my um, antibiotic, um, antimicrobial soaps or not. And we couldn't come up with any sort of, we did, couldn't find any factors that would explain why my belly button looks very different than the belly button of another uh, famous science writer um, with very different composition. And we're still trying to figure that out. I think it has something to do with the depths of the belly button and, and the anaerobic versus aerobic if you're really shallow. But that's really hard to ask people to like stick a probe in there. We asked and we didn't um, at that time. Yeah, but that's a really, that was a really good question, but yes. That, that would be the sort of the next line of pursuit. Um, but what that study did is it sort of tipped us on to something that, that there, it resonated with people. We had a lot of stories in the media about it um, and got us thinking that when we're talking about biodiversity and trying to connect and engage the public in biodiversity, um, we, don't have to just, we don't have to go to a tropical rainforest or to a coral reef to think about and understand biodiversity. But there's so much that we don't know um, in our backyards and on our bodies. And that really became the crux of the Citizen Science and Outreach Program that kind of grew out of the Belly Button Biodiversity Project. And so um, with Rob's lab, in, in collaboration him, with him, we led a program that was called Your Wild Life wildlife being two separate words, um, and that we were really focused on engaging the public in the study of the biodiversity um, in their daily lives, the things living on them, in them, and around them. And at one time, we had over a dozen projects that ranged from um, tracking the movements of indoor-outdoor house cats uh, that had homes, um, and we put GPS collars on cats and engaged a whole army of people to do that 
to looking at these tiny microscopic arthropods that live in the pores of our skin, particularly on our faces. We just want to see, right? That's a whole talk for another day. Um, to looking at patterns of arthropods um, in, in our homes. And uh, if you are interested in sort of learning more about your wildlife and those projects in general, um, just this past year, Rob released a book that really sort of pulled together the findings of all of those studies uh, that we did in collaboration with the public. And not just the public in North Carolina, but we, we engaged a wide audience across the country. And the world. Um, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about sort of what, um, what I learned through coordinating and working with citizen scientists on so many of these projects and the things that I think made our approach special and are things that I encourage, I encourage other researchers who are interested in um, using citizen science uh, as part of their practice, whether it's for public engagement or as, as to do and ask real research questions. And um, the first thing is that we focused on the hyper-local. We went to the places that scientists don't usually go or that don't usually have access. To. So that's inside people's homes, in their basements, into the, into the pores of their faces. Uh, we used basic natural history methods of sampling and observation, um, but we brought that to bear with modern technology. And so like I mentioned with the belly button project, we use molecular methods to sequence and understand um, microbial biodiversity. And we similarly used a lot of um, online tools, um, particularly um, like with the cat study, sort of being able to track um, using GPS collars in, in real time. We try to engage our, our um, citizen partners in the whole process of science. A lot of citizen science and the early roots of science were about um, having people contribute data, sending it in, um, but we tried to go beyond that. And so not only were people helping us collect data, but we tried to engage folks in the, um, the process of analysis, um, as well as in sort of helping and interpretation and helping us figure out where we're going to where we're going to go next. Partnerships and collaborations were really essential to our efforts. And so we were really lucky to partner um, with the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, which is the State Natural History Museum of North Carolina, just located down the street from NC State, where we were based. Um, and so we were able to find there other, science, other scientists who are publicly minded. Um, a number of our, partner, our research partners actually had labs that were embedded within museum exhibit space. And so part of their job was engaging the public in every day. And so they were really eager to have projects that the public could participate on. Um, the museum was incredibly important for bringing new audiences to our work and sharing the outcomes of those audiences, or of those, the outcomes of that research. And then also, um, we, through the museum as the hub, we were able to connect with educators and with schools and to really sort of broaden our reach, um, not only in, in sort of participating in the process of science, but sharing uh, the outcomes and, and what we learned. Science communication was critical to our efforts, and so we um, engaged artists and journalists, and we even had a team of creatives that were part of the Your Wildlife team to help us um, sort of constantly create, talk about, share um, what we were learning throughout the whole process of our citizen science research. And particularly when you're talking about research that's using molecular methods, sometimes that process is slow. It's not like the CSI where you take a sample, stick a machine, and get it back. And so a lot of times, our citizen scientists had to wait a long time to hear back about what we learned. And so it became really important for us to have an active blog and an active social media presence so that we could keep people engaged and let them know what was coming next um, or other ways that they could follow, follow their curiosity. Um, the work with the artists and the journalists was an added bonus, allowed us to kind of connect with people worldwide. I particularly enjoyed um, this artist, Joanna Raku, who was inspired by our Belly Button Biodiversity Project. And she was commissioned to do a project um, in, in, in the UK through the Wellcome Trust with the Eden Project, where she collected some of her own belly button samples from various people, um, plated them artfully, um, and then created these beautiful giant um, gel portraits that she mounted at belly button height as part of her art installation to talk about the, the microbiome. The, um, so, so maybe I'll now go kind of do a little bit of a deeper dive into some of those other year wildlife projects. We, um, after the belly button biodiversity project, 
we were thinking about where could we go next and what else do we not know or want to know um, about the microbiome, particularly as the, my, our human microbiome extends to our environment. And we're a better place to do that into the built environment and into our homes where we're increasingly spending more of our time. It's a space of increasingly taking up more real estate on the planet. This is an artist rendering um, of, 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 with I think silly string of, um, of the potential of all of all of the spaces in your home that are teeming with life that we really don't have a great understanding of who's there, who's where, um, and what what factors could explain that that biodiversity. And this is particularly important considering we were in, inspired by thinking about the hygiene hypothesis, which is um, this idea that as we as humans are becoming increasingly disconnected from our environment, we're closing ourselves the environment, particularly the environment of our ancestors, where there was more. Um, movement between the outside and the inside. As we're closing things off, living in these airtight boxes, um, could that be related? That, could that disconnection from the environment and could disconnection from microbes and organisms that we've evolved with, um, could that be the cause of some of the, the rise in um, a number of autoimmune diseases um, like asthma and allergies, um, et cetera? And so we thought by further studying, creating an atlas, of, um, of the home microbiome um, and really digging into some of those factors uh, that could explain those patterns of biodiversity, we might gain some insight about the hygiene hypothesis. So our next big project was called the wildlife of our homes. And we, um, we actively sought and received the participation of um, 1200, over 1200 homeowners and um, households across uh, North America. Um, particularly across the U.S. and including Alaska and, and Hawaii. And we asked our uh, participants, we sent them kits, sampling kits of sterile swabs, much like we stuck in our belly buttons. And we asked them to sample four common surfaces in their home. So uh, door trim inside their house, they're basically collecting dust. Door trim inside their house, door trim on the outside of their house, their pillowcase, if we wanted something that they were frequently touching, and their kitchen counter. And we analyzed those samples um, for both the uh, fungal and bacterial diversity. Here's an example of someone sampling their interior door frame. Uh, so far from that project, which we started in 2011, we're still publishing papers because the, the data set was um, enormous. Um, I should say too that in addition to um, asking people to sample those surfaces, we gave them an, uh, those surfaces, we provided them with a really extensive questionnaire about who lived in their house, what are their, um, what is the composition and the makeup of these different surfaces in their house, um, and who lives in their house being not only the humans, but also the plants and the animals. Um, how often they would leave, um, they're thinking about their behaviors, both with respect to cleaning, um, with respect to uh, ventilation, opening uh, windows, um, and, and the like, because we wanted to try to understand some of these factors that, that might affect um, what organisms we found inside their house. Uh, not surprising, homes are teeming with life. Um, many, many species that didn't have a name uh, we found, and we found um, patterns of biodiversity, um, particularly um, different areas of the home had um, different amounts of species richness. Um, and then particularly we found consistencies between different kinds of habitats across homes, no matter where you were. So um, in a, a really good example I like to talk about uh, was from a preliminary study that your pillowcase and your toilet seat microbially look pretty much the same. Uh, or that, uh, and so that's because those are all places where we touch. And so they're teeming with skin microbiomes. Whereas places that tended to collect dust, so thinking about door trims particularly, um, tended to have um, some similar composition with respect to bacteria. Um, if we look at predictors for that biodiversity, um, we find that the bacteria that we find inside of the house is actually best predicted by who lives there, particularly if you have a dog or a cat, um, and the number of people and the, the sex of those people that live in the house. And when it comes to fungi, um, generally speaking, what you see sort of outside the house on the exterior door trim is represented by what you see inside the house. We, as I mentioned, we have, um, we've been able to publish a lot of papers talking about both those, those sort of large scale factors as well as those factors in, inside the house. And I'm happy to talk about, about that later, I'm trying to give you just a taste. Um, with the samples of that dust, we've now been able to probe them um, to look at um, what, uh, what pollen are we finding um, on the, in those spaces on this house and can we build some predictive models there, as well as what kinds of arthropods are present in the dust of the house. So speaking of arthropods, 
I'm an entomologist, so my background is ecology, but I focus, I was situated in an entomology department. And um, for fun, um, one of the things that we did as we were waiting to get back data to some of our year wildlife um, participants, um, we asked them, give us a list of um, all the species that you think you or that you've seen or observed in, in your house. And um, people responded in mass, just this kind of long list with great detail, um, including this guy, which I actually had in my house in grad school and didn't really think about. Um, uh, so we saw in those lists if we made a word cloud and sort of the larger words represent species that are um, you tend to find more often. This one really jumped out at us, this thing called Timocrypus. And it became even clearer to us when uh, we had another visiting entomologist come to um, Rob's lab and he had noticed in somebody's house this, this big cricket, this camel cricket. Um, and we're like, well, you know, we have people across the country talk about these giant, these camel crickets. They were prevalent in the home that I lived in, in, in Raleigh. They were super jumpy. Um, I had them in my home in graduate, when I was a graduate student. Um, and this visiting entomologist, Peter Nutzrecki said, you, you know that this, species that's known as the greenhouse camel cricket um, isn't from North America. And we're like, hmm, this is interesting. People are saying that they have these in their home. They're not native to North America. We might want to probe that a little bit more deeply. Um, and it was particularly lent itself, the questions about it lent itself to citizen science because you could easily distinguish um, this greenhouse camel cricket that's from um, Southeast Asia uh, or from not Southeast Asia, from Asia, um, Japan and China, um, from the native North American camel cricket. Just, the pictures are pretty striking. Um, the greenhouse camel cricket has smooth hind legs. It's really stripy, super leggy and slender. Where I like to say that the Susopolis, the, the native North American camel cricket um, is built more like a tank and has these really meaty legs with large spines on them and a more modeled appearance, less than a stripe, um, more so than the stripy greenhouse camel cricket. If you look in the literature for records of this species, um, there was a paper from like 1940 saying that that species was found in greenhouses in Minnesota, believe it or not, in the late 1800s, but there was really nothing else in the literature. So we put out the word to our community of citizen scientists and said, do you have camel crickets in your house? And if you do, please send us a picture. And people responded in mass because people have very big feelings about, uh, about camel crickets. Should also, and this was my experience in graduate school too. They were down in the basement where we had our washing machine and they, they felt aggressive. Like they would hang out and then rather than jump away from you, they would jump towards you. Um, and they would be in these large numbers and they would leave their frass everywhere. And we, my roommates and I battled them. Um, and, and so we found, and I didn't like it, but I never in a million years would have guessed that this was a species that nobody knew really anything about. And so um, this is just an example of one of the pictures um, from our citizen scientists. And people would also report on our blog um, and share their big feelings. Um, this was probably the most heavily visited and trafficked um, part of our, our website. People also call the camel crickets spider crickets or sprickets is, an, is another name. And you can see this person was traumatized by them. They sold their house. They were, they were so traumatized. Um, but we kind of, much like the belly button biodiversity project, we were able to kind of zoom in onto something that got people, that, that meant something to people and it connected to their everyday lives. Um, we heard from loads of people. And so we were able to map the distribution of the greenhouse camel cricket in white, um, as well as the native camel, camel cricket. And we were able to report, um, we don't really have any reports from Minnesota now, but I, uh, that's making me think I need to go back um, and, and we need to ask some more questions. But essentially, this species was able to spread um, from house to house without many people um, noticing it. And they tend to live in sort of damp, dark environments like basements, like crawl spaces, like garages, places that scientists aren't gonna go. Um, so it was pretty remarkable. One of the things that I would like to do at some point um, is an oral history project, talking to people who uh, work under houses, because I met a couple of plumbers and electricians in Raleigh who could tell you exactly when they started noticing this cricket showing up as they were doing work under houses and it freaked them out too. So 
oh, then I moved to Minnesota. <laughs> um, and so I have the great opportunity as the Director of Public Engagement and Science Learning at the Bell to be thinking about, um, you know, how are we engaging our visitors um, and talking about natural history and talking about science and engaging people in science through our exhibits, through the planetarium, through our education and public program. And given my long sort of experience in history and citizen science, I'm really eager to think about how we might use the museum um, as, a, as a platform for engaging the public in, in citizen science. And so I've been at the Bell, it'll be two years in January. Um, and, and I've just been spending time sort of watching and observing and trying different things out um, to kind of understand the lay of the land. I think Minnesota is a really exciting place to be. There is, uh, at the university, there's a really strong presence of citizen science through things like the Monarch Larval Monitoring Project and through some of the work that's happening with Minnesota Mass Naturalists. Um, and so one of the things that we've done on the museum floor is we've created these discovery stations where we're not only trying to connect our visitors to research happening at the university um, through profiles of different researchers, but we're trying to connect them to citizen science and give and um, introduce them to opportunities and ways for, for them to get involved. This is sort of introducing them. I'm not sure, and I don't have the data to prove this, but my gut is that like that people are like, oh yeah, that's interesting, but then there's no deeper engagement or follow through um, in, in the moment. Um, we do have at the Bell, um, through our collections, um, our biodiversity collections, um, we've been able to participate um, in um, sort of an online citizen science project where we're working with the public to transcribe uh, specimens that have been digitized. It turns out people are better at transcribing labels than, than computers are. Um, and this work has been done through the Zooniverse platform, which is another strength that we have here at the University of Minnesota. The, um, this online platform for doing citizen science um, was, was founded by um, a member, um, a faculty member in physics that it originally started doing um, projects where you're classifying the swirls of galaxies. Um, but that platform, as a crowdsourcing platform, has expanded to include lots of other um, areas of research. And so we've been able um, to do a lot of things. You know, over 4,000 people have um, participated and helped us um, classify um, nearly 100,000 um, specimen records that we have in our collection. Through our um, public and K-12 programs, we also sort of introduce people to citizen science and then provide them with an opportunity to get involved. And so one of the things um, that we've done um, quite a few times now are take people out onto our learning landscape and help us document the biodiversity around the Bell Museum itself using an app called iNaturalist. Another place where we've experimented um, a little bit is sort of in introducing um, our audiences to citizen scientists themselves and maybe to see themselves and their curiosity reflected back. And so um, this past summer, we had an exhibit called City Stardust that was really focused on the work of Scott Peterson, who was a local guy. He's a stay-at-home dad and um, became really interested in these tiny bits of, of stardust, literally, um, called micrometeorites. There's one right there on that, that dot. So these are bits of cosmic dust that have made it through the atmosphere and are deposited on tops of roofs and in gutters. Um, and nobody knows a whole lot about them, but they are beautiful. And by taking um, sort of high resolution microscopic imagery, you can learn a lot about their origins and their composition. And so he's been able to follow that curiosity and partner with researchers here at the U um, and researchers in, in Norway to make some pretty significant discoveries um, about these tiny things. So this is leaving me to think, so all of this is to say, we're trying lots of things, um, and, um, but we haven't sort of found that thing that really sticks when it comes to, to the work that, that we're doing um, with, with our visitors and, and citizen science. And so I've been paying attention to um, what's happening in the museum world. I come from the type of citizen science where sort of a, a team largely of academics has a research question or an interest, and we want to think about how we can engage the public in, in studying and answer that, answering that question. But what the conversation that I'm hearing in um, the museum world is, is a little bit different, that, that there, there are a couple things afoot. Um, one, a lot of museums have moved from calling the practice citizen science to calling it community science. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for doing that. I think 
what most largely uh, those museums have made that shift because they want to be inclusive of, of their audiences, that your legal status shouldn't necessarily determine if you can participate um, in research. And, and so we've seen um, the Denver Museum of Nature and Science has gone to a community science model, um, the Los Angeles um, uh, Museum of Natural History, Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History um, has made that change. Um, and I was just reading on Twitter today, the Florida Museum of Natural History is also calling it community science. And that's to be reflective of and to be inclusive about who can, who can participate. But then there's more talk, and I just came back from the Association of Science and Technology Centers meeting, um, where one of the keynote speakers um, said that you can't just, it's not just about um, sort of who are you including and participating, but it's how you're actually doing that kind of research. Um, and that the keynote speaker, um, Raj Pandya, who works for the American Geophysical Union and the Fred and Earth, Earth Exchange, really pushed museum professionals to think about um, sort of what does that process look like and what are the role of the people um, and the communities in that science. So who is the expert? Or is it the members of the community or is it the scientists? Still arguing for this partnership between researchers and the public, but thinking about what knowledge each of those groups brings to the table. Um, and then also encouraging people to think about who is driving that process or driving the questions of research, who's asking them and answering them. I think the, the Denver group has done um, it kind of has taken an interesting approach because they have a public lab embedded within museum space. Uh, it's called the Genetics of Taste Lab. And that lab, um, there is a PI who's the head of the lab, but it's largely staffed by what they call community scientists. And so these are volunteers who are helping to collect um, samples and analyze the samples. And then those volunteers are actually deeply involved in figuring out um, what is the next question that they're going to ask next year in the work that they're doing. Um, I don't have answers. I just thought that if you all are thinking about, and when originally I was invited to give this seminar, um, I, I thought it would pose some interesting questions and maybe some interesting discussion points because it's a place where I think that um, the field of citizen science today compared to sort of you know 10 years ago when when I got when I got started is is really wrestling wrestling with and if I were starting um, a new project today it would be something that that I would be thinking about as well so with that there's my contact information and I'm happy to have a conversation so thank you yeah. Uh, Margaret Palmer uh, oh, was my advisor, okay. and I um, I studied my my dissertation was looking at um, energy flows across habitat boundaries, um, mm -hmm. and so I was interested in I worked largely in agricultural streams, had water streams that flowed through ag fields, and I was interested. What? Uh, I worked, um, which streams did I work in? Or um, I was in like Howard County, Maryland. They were super tiny headwater streams. So largely like Howard County um, near, and near Frederick. Um, so I was looking at uh, what kind of role did um, herbaceous vegetation growing on the sides of these streams play in um, food webs in those streams. Found lots of shredders in these open canopy sort of herbaceous streams. And then um, I was also interested in um, if the emerging aquatic insects for those streams could be a resource subsidy for natural enemy predators that move back and forth between the, um, the crop fields and then the, the buffers. But the real thing that turned me to uh, public science um, was that I, um, being situated in the entomology department um, at the time when the 17 year cicadas emerged in Maryland, um, we, I was part of a group that did a lot of outreach and extension around that. Um, and in preparing for that work I, and reading papers, I realized that uh, cicadas are emerged in some of the highest densities in riparian forests. And, um, and their life history strategy is to come out in sort of this massive pulse and that um, most of them don't actually get eaten by predators. Most of them die of natural causes and they're terrible flyers. And so I predicted they're like tanks. And I predicted that they would, most of those, they would fall in the stream. Um, and particularly at a year when, or at a time in the year when streams didn't receive a lot of those inputs. And so um, I measured the emergence. So I had traps measuring how much is coming out of the ground. 
I had I measured input, so I had lots of chops to look at what was going in, and then I measured changes in whole stream metabolism throughout, before, during, and after. I um, saw huge spikes uh, after this, this cicada input. Um, I did it because Margaret, Margaret moved over to Sysinc um, just as I was uh, finishing. So she was at the Chesapeake Biological Lab for part of the end of my, um, my work. But yeah, and she was really publicly engaged too and thinking a lot about policy and what is the sink now. So, yeah. That's fun being in the water. Partly. It's like I get to like talk to, talk to my people again. And um, how was how was the transition to I didn't know. So that I, um, I had worked after I finished my dissertation, I did science policy work in DC, and then I went up to Cornell and did work in extension with invasive species um, uh, for the American Institute of Biological Sciences. So they published bioscience and I worked in the public policy office. Um, and then with Rob, um, I um, I sort of, I led our citizen science efforts, so I did everything from like recruiting participants to um, sort of doing all of the science communication, coordinating the samples, logistics. I didn't do the microbial analyses. We partnered with a group at um, UC Boulder, Noah Fears Lab, to do um, that analysis piece, but I still had to know some microbial uh, ecology. And in fact, recently I went back to Denison, my alma mater, and um, saw the, the professor He's now retired. He taught microbiology. I had to apologize to him how embarrassed I was that I was publishing all these like microbiome papers, but that um, I never took microbiology in college. So <laughs> that was a little, a little bit embarrassing. So were, were you like, I guess, a uh, research coordinator? Like, I, so it was, um, I ended up having the title of like research associate. So it was a staff position. And then I went on actually after finishing up with Rob, I became the director of public science for the whole College of Sciences. I reported directly to the dean and then worked with our faculty and students to help them better connect their science to public audiences. Yeah. One of the concerns with citizen science is that, you know, you need certain protocols to make sure that the data mm -hmm. actually did. So when you're sampling your belly buttons or anything like that, how do you like train uh, the, the QA QC yeah, part? to avoid contamination? Well, so I think we give really specific instructions. Um, and then for that one, um, we didn't. I mean, I that they people were diligent. Um, I think part of with those that sampling too is that um, there's powers in the numbers and so the noise sort of um, that clear patterns um, emerge that sort of allow that transcends sort of any of that variation in the, the sampling um, that that we saw. So um, so we did. I, we did have another. Um, we did have evidence from the lab with a very different project with respect to um, ant biodiversity in backyards, where we did do some groups where we um, ran studies with undergrads who we gave sort of very explicit instructions to whether versus the like here's we trained them versus um, here's instructions like we would give to a citizen science scientist and there was um, no difference in the the validity the quality of of the data there I think most citizens people who participate in citizen science projects are um, they want to do a good job they want to follow directions clearly and we didn't have any problems with respect to that the uh, climatology department mm -hmm. here of course relies heavily on people throughout the state. Yeah, the like, weather mm -hmm, or with the climatic data. data. Um, and I imagine there's a lot of other efforts going on at the university. But one thing that we don't have is a really good network of people who are doing citizen science on water related issues. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there are people who go out and they monitor lakes. Yeah. And they'll do, you know, you know second guess monitoring mm -hmm. and things like that. But in rivers, we, we don't really have a big network. What kinds of questions would you want to deploy? What kinds of samples would be most interesting there? Or well, one of the problems is that most of the sampling in our rivers is done on a weekly basis. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the interesting features of water quality yeah. happen just after it rains. Yeah, right, right. And it's really hard for people from the Twin Cities, for example, to get out to you know rural areas that right. might be a three or four hour drive right. and collect those kind of samples. So 
having local people mm -hmm. get, um, do a better job of getting samples, right? Yeah. And the hydrograph is really a piece. Yeah. That would be really a great thing to have. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> actually, David, he convinced all the farmers to come and end up getting their <clears throat> samples out of their town. I think you could end up with a good educational yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think if I learned anything that like if, if you can connect that call for action or call to participation to something that's personally meaningful to people, um, I think that um, and connect on that that human level and use social networks to find those people. Um, I think that you'll you'll be set up for more more success. I would one of the concerns that I would have with um, particularly during um, sort of high rainfall events are the sort of the safety issues associated with that and with flash flooding and that you know how how are you gonna you're asking people to go do something that at a time that may be kind of dangerous and so thinking about what the um, what necessary sort of safety pieces would be involved. Um, would be would be interesting. Yeah, no, I think there's enormous power um, in citizen science, and I think that there's sort of huge questions that can that can be um, or a huge array of questions that that can be asked. I think one of the things that like I was talking about at the end of my talk, though, is thinking about you know what who is asking the questions and even spending time in those communities and ask, and asking them sort of like what are, what concerns you about the water here and what would you like to know um, and how might we be able to work together in partnership um, to, to understand some of those questions. Um, I think that that's an, that's an interesting space to be in and it's one that's uncomfortable for a lot of researchers too. Um, but, um, but I think good things have come out of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing like going out to see There's just the demographic of being citizen scientists. Mm -hmm. That's and right. Like, you know, your black type of farmers, slash young boys get stopped fishermen. Yeah. Like that. Um, you were, you know, thinking of ways to engage like schools. Yeah. Like, especially schools where you were like, you want to have a lot of people in the yeah. stream or something. I'm wondering if the Bell Museum's had, like, if any of your insight was like you get through That's your right. presentations, but if you have engaged schools and like younger students, maybe high school, high schoolers, um, in citizen science. Um, we, uh, well, so through our school um, field trip programs that will introduce, um, there's a seventh and eighth grade lab, like hands-on lab, where we do introduce them to citizen science and um, particularly about using iNaturalist as a tool for, for sort of cataloging biodiversity locally. Um, we don't currently have sort of the capacity or the infrastructure to full on launch a large scale citizen science project in that way. Um, I will say, though, that, um, and David's part of this, that we're producing a new planetarium show uh, called Minnesota Water Stories that's really trying to talk about um, water is issues from the cosmic <laughs> to the like, global to the local perspective. And there's, there's three sort of components to it, or geographic components within Minnesota that we're focusing on, um, Lake Superior, the um, Minnesota and Mississippi River um, basins, and then the, um, the Red River, because with water moving out in three, dire three directions. And one of the things that we learned in um, some pilot testing of, and just early versions of, of that show are that um, and we showed it to, to school groups and that um, teachers and the students were really eager for like, what can I do? How can I act? What's what's next? And so I, I think that there's there's great interest, but we I haven't we haven't figured out sort of what is what is that that next step? And maybe that's sort of another um, that could be like a grant opportunity potentially is to work with groups. I know that there's also interest. Um, Jack Finley um, has talked to us about um, because uh, he's been studying our stormwater um, management pond that we have on site on our learning landscape. Um, and that kind of green, those ponds are all over the place and oftentimes they're near, they're near schools. And is there an opportunity there to understand some of the dynamics happening there? 
Um, I think that's the part that's been hard for, that has been a little bit hard for me because I had been so deeply involved in citizen science and now to be in a place where I'm like, oh, I want to do all these things, but I also have to, we had to open a museum and we had to build all these new programs and thinking about where to go next. And I think for us to do that, we really need a, a partner. So whether that's researchers or a lab group or, or someone else connected to, um, would certainly be open to opportunities because we can bring the school groups and bring the people to the, to the table and kind of convene that together. It'd be exciting. Yeah. What do you think are the least effective methods for engaging people? Or recruiting people? With respect to citizen science or in, um, hmm. I'm trying to think if there's projects that, I mean, I, I really think being able to tap into what people's interests are is, is the way to go. People are inherently interested in themselves. Yeah. So that's how I think a lot of our stuff was really successful. But then people are really, they have passions about other things. And so um, I think that's why you've seen uh, a number of those astronomy projects um, really, um, while they are mostly classification projects, people have made, um, they're doing classification, but Zooniverse has also been able to create community online um, and really create a platform for encouraging people to um, sort of connect with each other and ask new questions. And so that there's been um, several papers where um, sort of people who are not trained as astronomers have made really important discoveries and celebrating those successes, I think is another important and important piece there. Um, I think particularly astronomy and birds um, are two areas where people are incredibly uh, passionate. And so it's tapping into that, those interest groups that, that may already exist. And I think that's where water actually has, has some possibility um, doing, doing more of that. Um, I think making people uh, feel that, um, I think a lot of people participate in citizen science because they want to contribute to something bigger than them themselves, but I also making them feel valued and that they recognizing that they did something as important, um, which is why we always made a point of providing that feedback and, and sharing those personal results and building the platforms online so we could we could connect with them in that way. There's been a, um, I don't remember how long ago, maybe there's, I guess since I started with Rob, there, there's there been a platform that's been growing that's called SciStarter.com, um, which is an online aggregator of citizen science projects. And so it's a place where people who are interested in, um, doing that kind of work can go and they can select, like, I'm really interested in water and I want to, this is my zip code and I want to find a project near me. Um, but they've also introduced new features onto their website. So it's, it's not just about matchmaking, uh, but that where an individual can keep track of their participation on lots of different projects. And so that they can sort of have some ownership of like, oh, I contributed uh, to this. Um, the other thing that I'll say is that, uh, and this is something I've observed in um, our galleries and then also in talking to other folks at other museums, that I don't think the invitation to participate should be like, do you know what citizen science is? Do you want to do that? Like that, that it may be, it's not important to people. Like it's more of, um, do you care about um, native pollinators in our landscape? Like drilling into the thing that people care about we would love your help. We'd love for you to partner with us to do this thing. Not, not sort of starting with like, this is what citizen science is and you have the opportunity to contribute to real, re like start with what, like make a stronger lead there. Um, and I think that's where, um, when I have the opportunity to kind of update some of our technology in the museum on our discovery stations, it's, we should be telling the story of like, look, we learned this thing because so many members of the public work together with researchers to help us figure that out. Wouldn't you like to be involved instead of what is citizen science? So those are just my sort of off the cuff questions. That's a good question. All right, well, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Like I said, we're always looking for uh, researchers across all career stages to, um, to work with. So um, feel free to contact me. We'd love to have um, you connect with our visitors at the museum. Bye out there. Yeah. Should I stop recording? Oh, yep.
Uh, yes. Yes. 